All right, we're back from a break. Just a little bit more on this uh, idea of modifying electrodes. A very popular way to modify electrodes very recently is a technique they call self-assembled films or self-assembly methods. And uh, often they are referring to not just a self-assembled film, but a self-assembled monolayer of a film. In that case, they often call them SAMs for uh, self-assembled monolayers. <clears throat> the idea of self-assembly is kind of a powerful one. It refers to, in a lot of cases, things that happen naturally. Bio biological systems self-assemble. They uh, go from a very small egg and sperm combination to us. And so that's a, a situation which biology has assembled the whole by allowing chemical gradients to take place, by putting energy in the right place. But uh, cell membranes, things like that, form by self-assembly processes. So the idea is how can we make films by using some of the ideas uh, in nature, and also how can we make films that resemble nature in some ways by self-assembling? We can get films that are similar to biological systems, or what they call biomimetic. Now, these, the vast majority of the materials are not very close to a biological system. It's using a uh, uh, a thiol. It refers to the fact that thiols in general will have a very strong coordinating bond to gold and other materials like copper too actually forms a good bond like that. But the, it forms a coordinating goal. So if you take an alkane group like C18 or C12, you have a long chain alkyl group and you have an alkane thiol like so and you put it in solution and you put it next to a gold electrode. What you'll find is that after a very short period of time, the alkane thiol will have <coughs> formed a set of structures that look something like this. I'm not drawing the alkane groups very well, but what you see is for very long ranges of order, which may be more than a micron, which is pretty good in a chemical scale or a molecular scale, you'll see a bonded coordinatively bonded sulfur groups and these alkane chains tilted all at the same direction um, and lining up like soldiers on the surface uh, with a very uniform uh, directionality. So this is a material where you don't have, we, don't, we didn't do, we didn't force those materials to do that. They self-assembled onto the surface into this particular structure. Um, and so this sort of thing has become a very popular idea to study biological systems where you can put biological type membranes that have, are attracted, attached with the sulfur at the end, or by studying long range electron transfer processes where you can try to put stuff on the outside of this film and see what happens. One of the guys that really helped popularize this was a guy named Chidsey who wrote a paper in science. Um, in 1991, volume 25, 91, page 919. And he was using these ideas to study the effects of long range electron transfer, which is an important process in photosynthetic processes where electrons get transported over long distances to do the reaction. Chris Chizzi did an experiment like so. He took and added on to the end of that alkane chain a ferrocene molecule. Remember we talked about ferrocene last time. Uh, this ferrous cyclopentadienyl group, and he attached it to a C16 polymer, 16 chain polymer, 16 alkene, 16 carbons, and then a, uh, an ester group, plus a, uh, a uh, dil diluent, a C16 diluent. So you've got some ferrocene terminated alkane chains and some non-terminated alkane chains, or just straight alkane change. And this is a 0.1 millimolar. This is 0.9 millimolar. Now, if you if this stuff absorbs in a in the, in proportion to the solution concentration, we'd see 
effectively a 10% would have ferrocene and the rest would have this other non-active structure. So he hopefully saw a system like this where you have gold molecules at the surface, sulfur, and then you see these chains lined up all in a row and they're lying down because that turns out to they're lying down at an angle or a little bit of an angle because that minimizes the surface energy. And then at the end of one of those, you're going to have this, or at least in this particular thing, you're going to have this ferrocene. And this is often, what they do is they put this material in an ethanol solution and they let it soak. They let this material soak for say an hour or 24 hours and the longer they soak usually the better looking films they get. Now we can get an electron from this gold at the surface to the, uh, the ferrocene on the, on the end. In fact, well the, the electron would be the other way. This we could oxidize ferrocene. So we can pull an electron off. In order to do that though, that electron has to tunnel or be transported that very long distance. Um, across that polymer film. If Chidsey does the experiment very slowly, you see the wave that you'd expect for a surface bound species, an absorption wave. So you get a wave like this. If he speeds up the scan rate, you see the initial effects of electron transfer kinetics and you don't see a symmetrical delta E peak or delta E peak approximately zero here, now delta E peak greater than zero. And if you use the proper theory, you can actually extract the rate of electron transfer uh, by looking at the peak separation. You can also get the information of electron transfer kinetics over long ranges by tunnel apparometry. And the idea is that the I is proportional to the apparent rate constant times the charge times an exponential function of the, um, the apparent rate times the time of the experiment. And he finds that the standard rate constant apparent is equal to the real rate constant by an exponential function times a term minus beta d, where d is distance and beta is um, what they call a tunneling parameter. And it's, he found that beta was on the order of 1.3 to 1.8 angstroms, reciprocal angstroms. Now let's, let's review this experiment. We put this ferrocene on the surface. We're doing electron transfer back and forth from the surface. What we want to do is measure the true rate of electron transfer for the uh, electron to be back and forth. The idea is that the true rate of electron transfer is hidden by the fact that we measure some rate constant, which is the apparent rate constant. And the true would be able to be extracted by considering that the, the apparent would be an exponential function times the true uh, times the distance it has to tunnel, exponential function of distance, modified by a, uh, a, what, a fudge factor, if you will. It's a tunneling parameter. And that tells you what the influence is of the intervening material is on the tunneling process. So some materials would have a different beta factor, but it turns out for these alkane type chains, you see betas on the order of 1.3 to 1.8 reciprocal angstroms. The reason he was interested in this is that you can use Marcus transfer theory, electron transfer theory, try to determine uh, rate constants and it turns out that 
V gets curves like this, which is what you'd predict from Marcus theory. It turns out if you use normal butler volmer theory, you'd get straight lines. Uh, and um, they can fit it using a solvent reorganization parameter. Okay. Note the uh, rate constant here is not centimeters per second, it's actually reciprocal seconds because the process is not a diffusional process, it's a surface process and that uh, has different units on the rate. So you could actually determine the lambda values from this data as well as getting this tunneling factor. One thing with this experiment that's kind of tricky is the presence of dislocations or disorganized film will really screw these experiments up. You can think of the, the films being pre associated in a, in a these laying down forms, but there can be what they call phase boundaries, where some of the, the uh, things are laying in this direction, and then there can be a boundary where they're all laying in the other direction. In that particular case, there is now a hole in the layer where solvent molecules, or the, in this case, the ferrocene can be laying down inside that film and so be very close to the electrode surface. So that really changes the rate of electron transfer much more rapidly now. So even a small percentage of these very rapid ferrocene holes in the surface or ferrocene type dislocations will cause the rate to be much different than it would be if we have a rate like this. The other thing that can happen, and that's one of the reasons they go with 0.1 millimolar to 0.9 or a 10% coverage, is that we can get self-exchange. Because the ferrocenes at the end are gonna be very close if they were full of ferrocene, we can get an electron coming up here and that electron can hop, hop, hop to the, the, the other uh, uh, ferrocenes, perhaps because there's a ferrocene here at the end that's laying down and so you can get um, a, this sort of process here and that um, can cause the rate to be quite different as well. So one of the, one of the ways they avoid that sort of pro process is to make that very dilute solution on top or dilute concentration of those ferrocenes at the end so that the hopping is suppressed. So self-assembly is very common. There's another very useful method for doing this called the langmuir blodgett films that are quite old now. But they kind of became more popular with the advent of some of these other things. And it's been around for a long time. They can use to determine the surface properties of, of uh, molecules, surfactants, and so on. The idea is that if you take a tray And on top of that tray, you put a, uh, a molecule that has a polar and, and nonpolar seg segments. So for example, you could put a molecule that's an alkane molecule that has a polar head group, like a sulfonate or an amine on the end. If you put that on the surface, just like any organic molecule, the nonpolar end will not really want to dissolve in solution. So what happens is that the material sits on the surface because the polar head group can be in the water where it prefers and the nonpolar surface can be as far away from the water as it can be, which is at the surface. And what this is here at the end is a, what they call a float or a balance and they can squeeze that float in. You can spread a certain amount of this material on the surface. You can squeeze that float towards, so you can compress that layer of molecules on the surface. And what happens is that if you can do that compression and you plot the force versus distance here, where this would be zero, 
you see that the, as you start to compress those molecules, the force increases. The molecules start to repel each other, starts to increase, and then at some point, when they're as co compacted as they can possibly be, the force increases dramatically. All right, so the force increase there suggests to you that the film on the surface of the water or the solution is like this, where the material is now oriented with the polar head groups in the water and the float compressing them together to form this nice group of material. So they're lined up all in a row on the surface. Now if you continue to compress this material, what will happen is that they'll tend to stack up again and again on each other. That's not what you want to do. So you can compress it past this force, but you will tend to see a very sharp increase on the form. So these are langmuir blodgett balances. They're kind of finicky instruments to work with. What can we do with this thing? Well, now that we've got a, an ability to make these layers of material, what you can do is you can take, while maintaining it in this particular region and maintaining a force, is you take an you can take an electrode and dip it in the uh, material. And because of the polar properties of the electrode itself, what you can do is you can get a you can get a layer of this film on top of the that sits on top of our, our electrode. So what you do is you dip your electrode in and you pull it out as you're compressing the, the film. And now you've got, at the end, you'll have a layer of material on your electrode. And hopefully it will be lined up like, like that. And so that's one way, another way to make a, a layer like this. The nice thing about the langmuir blodgett method is that you can dip this material in again and again to form multi-layers. And so you can make a material like so, where the uh, films tend to stack up on each other. And this now becomes a, an analogy to bilayers and cell membranes and so on. So these are very useful for those biomimetic type systems where you use a LB film to make, say, layers of phospholipids on surfaces and try to examine the processes that are going on there. So you can think about, well, okay, I could do that, then I could put in a, a protein that's a poor protein in the thing and then see how that allows electron transfer or ion transfer in and out of that layer of material on the surface. So this is a very interesting current topic in electrochemistry. Well, that's uh, basically done for that chapter. We've done that and then a little bit more.